Good afternoon. Welcome to our October 2023 webinar, part of our monthly continuing professional development webinar series for health professionals. My name is Lisa Dewald, and I have the pleasure of being here today. I'm the Associate Director of the Villanova University Fitzpatrick College of Nursing's McDonald Center for Nutrition Education and Research. I have the pleasure of being the moderator for today's webinar. As always, we're so grateful you decided to spend the next hour with us, and we thank you for your ongoing feedback and suggestions for webinar topics. This webinar topic came as a result of that. Today, we are dealing with a sensitive topic how to navigate weight-related conversations in clinical practice using the trauma-informed care model. And are, we are excited to get started. So we extend a hearty welcome to you today, whether it's your first webinar or whether you regularly attend our monthly webinars. If you attended our webinar last month, you heard some big news. We're very excited to announce that our center has adopted a new name that represents our commitment to professional development and applied research in a variety of ways. Rooted in science and equity, the McDonald Center for Nutrition Education and Research, now known as McNer, is committed to providing health professionals with the latest evidence-based nutrition research through professional development programs such as the one we have today. We invite you to embrace the new offerings we'll be providing and encourage you to continue to let us know what you would like to learn more about. We value your feedback, and as I mentioned earlier, we use it in our planning. Before we begin the presentation, I would just like to remind you that PDFs of today's PowerPoint slides are posted on the McDonald Center for Nutrition Education and Research website. After going to the website, just look for webinar on the menu bar, followed, um, and then you can follow that to today's webinar, which is presented by Dr. Robin Poshby. The Q&A box will be open throughout the presentation for you to ask a question. We'll address as many questions as possible, but we will wait until the end of the presentation. The expected length of the webinar is one hour, and the recorded session will be placed on our website within the next week. If you used your phone to call in to the webinar today and want CE credit for attending, just take a moment after the webinar to email us at mcner, M-C-N-E-R, at villanova.edu and provide your name so that we can send you a link um, to an evaluation and receive your CE certificate. Villanova Fitzpatrick College of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. Villanova University and Louise Fitzpatrick College of Nursing, McDonald Center for Nutrition Education and Research is a continuing professional education CPE accredited provider with the Commission on Dietetic Registration. Accredited status does not imply endorsement of, of this program or uh, by Villanova University or by the McDonald Center for Nutrition Education and Research. This activity, this month has been approved for one contact hour or one CPEU for nurses and dietitians. The suggested CDR performance indicators are listed on the slide. And the CDR level of the webinar is two. Remember that you must attend the entire webinar presentation to receive continuing education credits. While everyone is encouraged to complete a post-program evaluation, to receive contact hours, all nurses must complete the evaluation. And finally, I have the privilege of introducing today's speaker. Uh, Robin Pashby, PhD, is a clinical health psychologist in Washington, DC, and owner director of DC Health Psychology, as well as co-founder of the Modern Psychologist Online Mind Body Program, Mind Body Health Program. Dr. Pashby earned her PhD in medical and clinical psychology from the University Services University of the Health Sciences, F. Edward Hebert School of Medicine. She serves on the National Board of Directors of the Obesity Action Coalition and is an author or co-author on numerous peer-reviewed journal articles addressing weight-related psychological and behavioral interventions and communication practices, and she frequently presents nationally on these topics. 
There are no relevant relationships, financial relationships with ineligible companies for those involved with the ability to control the content of this activity. The planners will review participant feedback to evaluate for real or perceived commercial bias in any activity. And now I would like to ex extend a really warm welcome to Dr. Robin Poshby and invite her to share her screen and presentation with you. Um, remember, during the presentation, if you have questions and answers, you can post your questions and answers in the Q&A box. Um, and thank you, Dr. Poshby. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you. I can stop my share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you everyone for being here. And uh, as Lisa mentioned, I'm gonna discuss trauma-informed care when discussing weight in clinical practice. But before I launch into that, I just wanna warn you that I understand the complexity, the hurt, the pain, the um, conflict around discussing weight at all. And so I, I offer you this perspective. I do not uh, assume that it's the only perspective. And uh, I appreciate your respect as we go through this talk. So what I'm gonna talk about today, I have decided is a lot like hand washing, right? And I'll get back at the end to that, but I just wanna sort of leave you uh, as we very begin with this image of hand washing. So let's start at the start. Um, obesity, some people don't prefer that term, but um, the medical term obesity is complex and is multifactorial health condition. Um, the AMA defines obesity as a complex chronic disease, but either way, we know that obesity and health, both mental health and physical health, have a bi-directional relationship. Finally, I wanna just lay this on the line at the start, weight bias is harmful, okay? So uh, as we sort of go through these pieces of the puzzle, let me start with, um, this is a great map that is available. Um, this is one of, of many, many, many maps, the Foresight Obesity System map. And you're not, you don't need to look at the details to understand that obesity is a complex system dr or uh, issue driven by all of these different systems. And the reason I highlight this map is because yes, it talks about food consumption and physical activity, the sort of most common things people think about, but it also talks about physiology, the environment in which you live, and your individual and social psychology. They are contributing factors to the complex condition of obesity. And obesity, as I talked about, is so co-occurring with mental health conditions, it's frequently um, accompanied by depression, and the two can definitely influence one another. So while BMI is certainly not the end-all be-all, there's a strong relationship at the population level for women with a high BMI and more frequent thoughts of suicide. So just to sort of highlight for you, right, these are data from um, uh, 2005 to 2010, but the statistics look similar now, that the patients with higher levels of BMI report more severe mental health conditions like depression and suicidality. So there are two possible mechanisms linking mental health and obesity, which I am going to discuss today. There are many more than that, but the two that I'm gonna focus on today are ACEs or adverse childhood experiences and weight bias. So first, you probably have heard about this, but back in um, the early nineties, there was some really good research um, that the original ACEs study was long before that, but that looked at um, how childhood maltreatment, so childhood experiences such as exposure to abuse or neglect, um, experience of abuse or neglect personally, um, domestic violence in the home, a uh, parent with alcohol or other drug addiction, how these sorts of adverse childhood experiences affected someone as an adult. And what we see is that um, reported child maltreatment is strongly linked to the risk of having a BMI of greater than 40. And there was an interesting uh, series of bariatric uh, studies on bariatric surgery candidates back in the 2005-2006 range, which showed that people who were um, pursuing bariatric surgery reported that uh, the study reported that 69% scored above the clinical cutoff for um, assessment of childhood trauma. This is two to three times higher than what we consider normative values in the population. 
However, while adverse childhood experiences have been seen as predictors of obesity over time, I don't want to minimize the impact of weight bias and stigma and its internalization on people on their physical and mental health. So most recent statistics show us that 42% of U.S. adults say that they have faced weight bias. 50% of U.S. adults with obesity report internalized weight bias, which means that they experience the, um, excuse me, they experience the weight bias and begin to believe those things about themselves. So let me break these two things down. Any adverse childhood experience is a potentially traumatic event or situation that undermines the safety, stability, and bonding experience that a person has before age 18, essentially. And as I mentioned before, instability due to a, a parental separation or a parent member being um, in prison, having not enough food to eat, having unstable housing, experiencing discrimination. These are all examples of what we would call adverse childhood experiences. And as I mentioned, the more adverse childhood experiences a person has, the greater likelihood, A, that they have obesity, and B, that they have other physical problems. So this is just one of many studies, this was back in 2018, that looked at percentage of participants based on the dark bar is no childhood adversity, and the lightest bar is people with three or more childhood adverse experiences. Now, so we talked about ACEs, let's talk about weight bias and stigma. So just to get us all on the same page, weight bias is defined as negative weight-related attitudes, beliefs, and assumptions, and judgments toward an individual with overweight or obesity based solely on the person's size or weight. And weight stigma is weight-based discrimination or stereotype based on someone's weight. They often get used interchangeably. And over time, these Situ uh, these experiences become internalized. That is known as internalized weight bias. Way back in 2004, the movie Mean Girls, maybe some of you remember that, had a quote in it that I think really sums up some of the impact of weight bias on body weight. So Jessica Lopez in the movie says, Laura, I don't hate you because you're fat. You're fat because I hate you. And I want you to understand that this sort of language, which was in a movie in 2004, is just the tip of the iceberg. Weight-based discrimination is, is, is um, correlated and causal to um, depression, to anxiety, to the stress response that people experience both physiologically through increased HPA axis activation, increased cortisol, insulin resistance, and increased um, inflammatory markers, as well as behavioral responses. In fact, we know for certain that people who get exposed to weight-based stigma and experience weight bias in the world are more likely to engage in binge eating, to engage in um, disordered relationships with food, to in and to have lower motivation for physical activity, in part because a lot of physical activity is done in places where people feel vulnerable to uh, size-based judgment, such as a gym or other. We also know that weight stigma results in a, in a person's decrease in trust with their healthcare services. So that can reduce their adherence to treatment options. It reduces their uh, attendance at primary or follow-up appointments and also impacts the communication that people have with their providers. And of course, all of these things combined can really influence a person's self-esteem, body image, but also their weight. And as I mentioned earlier, it can result in impacts, negative impacts in their healthcare utilization. So weight bias experiences cover a gamut of things in employment. Stigma is present from job interviews to performance evaluations. And unfortunately, there are no federal regulations yet to promote weight-based or size-based discrimination at work. Healthcare. Um, Physicians, nurses, and others often label weight as a what's called a go-to cause, even if the issue is unrelated. So I can't tell you how many patients I've had say that they don't bother going to a healthcare appointment because they feel worried that what's going to happen is that everything that's wrong with them is going to be blamed on their weight. 
the media goes without saying that while things have improved, we still see these headless images of people living with obesity who are depicted as lazy couch potatoes or overeaters. And it just portrays this weight stigma throughout uh, movies and television and commercials. In relationships, we know that um, family members as well as romantic partners are teasing and bullying people with higher weight. And finally, in the public, even something as simple as having a, a chair that is sized appropriately for someone living in a larger body is something that can cause problems. So a client of mine told me a story about how she went to her physician's office and had to stand because there was no chair in the waiting room that was appropriately sized for her body and how embarrassing and shaming it was for her to experience that. This is a really interesting study done uh, back in 2022. And it just looked at, um, it, it's a small sample, right? Only 89 people. But what it was looking at is reports of um, medical staff inappropriate behavior in contact with patients with obesity reported by other medical staff that they worked with. And what you can see here is that disgruntled grimaces 88% of, of people reported that their colleagues, they witnessed their colleagues showing a disgruntled grimace when working with someone with obesity. And the list goes on and on. Rebecca Poole, who is probably the most um, well-known researcher in weight bias, states, the alarming rates of obesity have brought widespread attention to the medical consequences of this public health problem. Often ignored, however, are the social and personal obstacles that individuals with excess weight or obesity face. Bias, stigma, and discrimination due to weight are frequent experiences for many people with obesity that have serious consequences for their personal and social well-being and overall health. And given that at least half of the American population has overweight, the number of people potentially faced with discrimination and stigmatization is immense. So I'd like to share with you a, just a very brief uh, four minute video that gives an example of weight based stigma. I want to take a moment to address a situation that has become a talking point in this community over the past week and especially on Facebook that centers around me. On Friday, I received the following email from a lacrosse man with the subject line, Community Responsibility, and it reads as follows. Hi, Jennifer. It's unusual that I see your morning show, but I did so for a very short time today. I was surprised indeed to witness that your physical condition hasn't improved for many years. Surely you don't consider yourself a suitable example for this community's young people, girls in particular. Obesity is one of the worst choices a person can make and one of the most dangerous habits to maintain. I leave you this note hoping that you'll reconsider your responsibility as a local public personality to present and promote a healthy lifestyle. Now, those of us in the media, we get a healthy dose of critiques from our viewers throughout the year, and we realize that it comes with having a job in the public eye. But this email was more than that. While I tried my best to laugh off the very hurtful attack on my appearance, my colleagues could not do the same, especially my husband, our 6 and 10 anchor, Mike Thompson. Mike posted this email on his WKBT Facebook page, and what happened next has been truly inspiring. Hundreds and hundreds of people have taken the time out of their day to not only lift my spirits, but take a stand that attacks like this are not okay. Now we're gonna have more on that in just a second, but first, the truth is, I am overweight. You could call me fat, and yes, even obese on a doctor's chart. But to the person who wrote me that letter, do you think I don't know that? That your cruel words are pointing out something that I don't see? You don't know me, you are not a friend of mine, you are not a part of my family, and you have admitted that you don't watch this show, so you know nothing about me but what you see on the outside, and I am much more than a number on a scale. And here is where I want all of us to learn something from this. If you didn't already know, October is National Anti-Bullying Month, and this is a problem that is growing every day in our schools and on the internet. It is a major issue in the lives of young people today, and as the mother of three young girls, it scares me to death. Now, I am a grown woman, and luckily for me, I have a very thick skin, literally, as that email pointed out, and otherwise. And that man's words mean nothing to me. 
But what really angers me about this is there are children who don't know better, who get emails as critical as the one I received, or in many cases even worse, each and every day. The internet has become a weapon. Our schools have become a battleground. And this behavior is learned. It is passed down from people like the man who wrote me that email. If you are at home and you are talking about the fat news lady, guess what? Your children are probably going to go to school and call someone fat. We need to teach our kids how to be kind, not critical, and we need to do that by example. So many of you have come to my defense over the past four days. I am literally overwhelmed by your words. To my colleagues and my friends from today and from years ago, my family, my amazing husband, and so many of you out there that I will probably never have the opportunity to meet, I will never be able to thank you enough for your words of support and for taking a stand against this bully. We are better than that email. We are better than the bullies that would try to take us down. And I leave you with this. To all of the children out there who feel lost, who are struggling with your weight, with the color of your skin, your sexual preference, your disability, even the acne on your face, listen to me right now. Do not let your self-worth be defined by bullies. Learn from my experience that the cruel words of one are nothing compared to the shouts of many. We'll be right back. Her example, I think, is powerful. Um, that's from many, many years ago, and I've saved that clip ever since um, because it resonates so much with experiences my patient has have had. So I want to take you through a day, right? And and we all have different lives, of course, and I respect that this is a very privileged day that I'm about to take you through, but think about an average person um, that you might come into contact with. Maybe they wake up in the morning, they choose what to wear, they go to work, maybe on the way home they stop at the grocery store, they scan the evening news, maybe they sit on the couch with a family member and watch TV at the in the evening. Maybe if they're lucky, they have elders in their lives who they can spend time with on the weekend. If they have a family, maybe they attend a soccer game or a sporting event of their child's. They hopefully get their routine medical care. They go for a walk. They maybe go out to have dinner with a friend and try to get some sleep in the evening. So one perspective of this average patient's day is that the patient has a job, stable employment, gets to the grocery store, has social connection, gets their routine medical care, tries to get some exercise and focuses on getting enough sleep, right? That's a really good day. And you think, boy, that person's really got it. But let me share with you another perspective. This is a perspective that I have in treating patients living with internalized weight bias. For example, the alarm goes off. And by the way, these are all real quotes from my patients. Um, the alarm goes off and she says, I think, did I somehow wake up and eat last night? If the answer is no, I think, oh, thank God, maybe I've lost weight. Getting dressed in the morning, they might think none of these clothes fit right, but I refuse to buy a bigger size. I'll just wear these same pants and hope no one notices. At work, my colleagues must think I'm so lazy. I look frumpy and fat. I secretly feel like I have to prove to them how hard I work. I have to lose this weight. At the grocery store, I'm ashamed to buy ice cream for my kids. I should only buy the healthy stuff. I saw that guy looking at me. I'll just hide it under my veggies in, these, in this cart. Reading the paper, another story about weight medications. If I were stronger, I wouldn't need this stuff. It's such a crutch. In the evening, do you think my partner noticed the mattress is sagging on my side of the bed? With an elderly parent, my mom just gave me the look. This shirt clings to my disgusting fat stomach and she noticed my weight gain. I really need to lose this weight. At a kid's soccer game, my kid is such a great athlete and so fit. I bet these parents and coaches can't believe that he's my kid. I need to lose this weight. At the doctor, maybe I should cancel this doctor's appointment, right? They told me to lose weight at the last visit and I haven't. She must think I don't care or I'm lazy. Maybe I should wait until I've lost weight. Out for a walk in the neighborhood. My, labor, my neighbors must be laughing at the fat man out for a walk. I bet better make this quick so no one sees me. I really need to lose this weight. Out to dinner with friends. They're all getting burgers, but I could never order that. Me ordering a burger? Typical. The waiter would be so disgusted. I need to lose this weight. And lying your head down at night, 
Tomorrow I'll do better. I'll buckle down. I need to be more disciplined. I have to lose this weight. These are all quotes and examples my clients have given me over the years of living with internalized weight bias. And because of that, I think it's so beautiful that my patient who's 56 years old summed it up for me. I view every single experience in my life through the prism of my body size and I have since I was eight. So given that, you can understand how flat it lands on people when they hear things like, it's time to get serious about your weight. Or have you thought about getting some more exercise? Or I think just basic things can help. Like firstly, just determination that you wanna do something about it. And by the way, these are also quotes from physicians and healthcare providers to patients living with high weight. And if you look at the research, it matches what our patients say to themselves about themselves, non-compliant, lazy, stupid, undisciplined, and lacking willpower. Those aren't just self-talk statements that patients living with obesity have often, but they're also um, words that people trained in obesity medicine tend to relate to people living with obesity. This quote sums up what I'm trying to get across. Every weight bias experience is like a mini trauma. It leaves a mark and makes it harder to recover. These mini traumatic experiences have been part become part of my life. Looking back on those experiences of weight bias, bullying, teasing, and abuse, I can tell that the stigma scars are permanently imprinted in my brain. Because of that, we are here to talk about a trauma-informed approach when discussing weight, because it accounts for the possibility that every single patient you see may have a history of traumatic stress, not just the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, but stigma and bias as well. So let me take you through the ABCs and the one, two, threes of trauma-informed care. First, it's important to know that a trauma-informed approach is not just on you, right? It is a systematic and organizational approach to taking care of our patient. And it, dis and it relies on us understanding the neurological, biological, psychological, and social impact of trauma or traumatic experiences on a person as well as the heavy burden of those effects on individuals, families, and communities. Bottom here and start with the three E's, move to the four R's, and then the four C's to help, you talk, uh, to help talk you through how to actually use this. So first, the three E's, I like to think of it as the what, right? So the three E's of trauma are the event, the experience, and the effect. So Individual trauma results from an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances that is experienced by the individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. I think we could say, given the video that I just played you, that experiences with weight bias and bullying certainly meet this criteria. The four R's, so if the E's are the what, I like to think of the four R's as the, the why, right? Why bother implementing a trauma-informed approach? So this starts with realizing, recognizing, responding, and resisting. So the four R's in a nutshell are that the realization or recognition about trauma and how it can affect people and groups helps you as a healthcare provider to recognize the signs of trauma and create and maintain a system which can respond to trauma and resist re-traumatization, okay? So the four R's. Now the four C's are the actual how. And I think um, Dr. Kimberg is actually credited with this back in 2019, she came out with this paper. And I think it is such an excellent hands-on approach to figuring out how we use a trauma-informed approach. So the first C is calm. When we think about calm, we think about paying attention to how you as a healthcare provider are feeling when you are actually caring for your patients, right? Allowing you a moment to take a deep breath and to calm yourself before interacting with patients. Because we know that modeling and promoting calmness for yourself 
your patient and your coworkers helps us to co-regulate. Any one of you that's ever been a parent or is a parent understands what co-regulation is, right? It's this idea that we stay calm to help the people in our orbit be calm too. So C, the first C is calm. And it's not just about calming your patients, it's about calming yourself. Number two is containment or contain. And this is really about setting yourself up to have good, predictable, and reliable boundaries. So modeling healthy relationships and boundaries help you earn trust with your patients, right? Things like normalizing the fear of being in the healthcare setting for someone living with obesity. Many patients, many patients, have experienced broken promises, betrayals of trust, negative comments, stigma, et cetera. And so our job is to normalize that that has happened for them. And then we resist the urge to overextend ourselves. Now, I understand I have um, nurses in my family and I understand how stretched thin you can sometimes be. But overextending yourself to provide care doesn't help set up the trauma-informed approach, right? So a good rule of reliability is not to make any promises that you can't keep, but not to then overextend yourself so that you also can't be calm when you show up with your patients. The third C is care. Again, practicing self-care and compassion, both for your patients, but also for yourself, right? Compassion humility and respect are reflected throughout the trauma-informed healthcare system, including the people at the front desk, the people answering the phones, how you chart in your um, note system or your EMR, how you write your notes, at your patient um, appointments and interactions, of course, and during follow-up with them. You move from a mindset of what's wrong with you to what happened to you what's wrong with you to what happened to you helps you create an environment of compassion for you and your patients. And the last C is coping. Emphasizing coping skills and positive relationships builds hope and resiliency, not just for your patients, which of course is important, but for you as a healthcare provider. Helping you to shift the perspective that coping skills are not always positive. Recognizing that patients you see who do things like overeat or use substances or get lost in hours and hours of, of phone video games, that sometimes adverse behaviors are actually an attempt at coping with dis, um, discomfort right, with coping with really hard feelings that can result from all sorts of experiences in a life, whether it's adverse childhood events or simply living with weight bias and stigma in an internalized way. So sometimes people develop coping skills in response to those negative experiences that actually end up harming them more in the long run. If you find yourself an emotional eater when you feel very stressed, you might understand that. And so emphasizing coping skills isn't about saying what's right or what's wrong, but it's recognizing why people engage in these alternative ways of coping. So I want to challenge some assumptions about trauma-informed care because I give this a style of presentation uh, fairly regularly, and I get a, a few common types of questions. So let me go through three basic assumptions and challenge those. So first, I can't implement trauma-informed care because I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist, right? I, I speak to physicians. I speak to nurses, physical therapists, personal trainers, pretty much anyone who will listen about the importance of a trauma-informed care approach. And one thing people often say is, but I don't know how to do that. That's not what I'm trained for, right? I don't know how or I don't want to treat trauma. I didn't train for that, so I'm going to refer out for it. So the fact to challenge that is recognizing that trauma-informed care is not the same thing as trauma treatment. 
Trauma treatment is critically important, and you're right, should be done by a qualified mental health professional. But implementing the, the values of trauma-informed care is a style of interaction, right? It's not a treatment plan. So assumption two, trauma-informed care takes more or too much time. I have physicians or nurses saying things to me like, I am constantly stretched thin and running behind. I simply cannot add another thing to my appointments. And boy, do I hear you, right? I am. I have the luxury of spending a large amount of time with my patients, often on a weekly or every other week basis. I recognize that you don't have that time. But the fact is trauma-informed care requires a change to how you practice, not what you already do. OK, so an example I like to give of this is in is parenting. Um, I've read so many parenting books in this world of trying to figure out how to parent a lively and spunky, almost nine year old. And I remember early on in her toddler years, figuring out that I could say, go pick up your socks or go brush your teeth. And I could basically start World War Three or I could change how I approach that and say, do you want to pick up your socks in two seconds or 10 seconds? And inevitably she would say 10 seconds and then jump up and do it. So it wasn't like I added anything to what I asked of her, right? I simply changed how I was interacting. And that's what comes to my mind when I think about implementing trauma-informed care. It's not adding anything. It's just simply reorienting how you approach it. Assumption three. I will use trauma-informed care when it's necessary, right? I've had physicians say to me um, or he other healthcare providers say things like, you know what, I'm really lucky. Most of my patients are fine. Um, and if someone discloses trauma to me, of course I know how to respond appropriately, right? I have a good list of referrals. I know how to be compassionate. And so this is where I wanna challenge that assumption because I don't think of trauma-informed care as reactive. I think of it as proactive. I think of it as something that can be universally applied and that is universally beneficial. And this is where I circle back to the beginning and I like to equate trauma-informed care with hand washing. Now, you don't wash your hands only before you go in to see a patient who you think might have some communicable disease, a flu, the cold, a cold, something else right? No, you wash your hands proactively and regularly because it's a universal precaution that protects both you and your patients. So trauma-informed care can be similar to a hand washing, right? It's something that you just do regularly. Now, in this sort of end here, the, the final few minutes of, of our time with me just talking before we go into a Q and A, I just wanna remind you that this safety, the empowerment, the resilience and the healing that comes from a trauma-informed approach actually works both ways, okay? And so what do I mean by that? What I mean is that trauma-informed care can actually transform the healthcare experience for patients and employees alike by fostering community, empowerment and healing. We know, and there is actually a burgeoning literature that shows that when people and systems and organizations are using a trauma-informed care approach, that people tend to feel better. And so I just pulled up a few of the many um, uh, pieces of literature out there. And I think it's this, this one stands out to me um, here from the Harvard Medical School that says trauma-informed care, a missing link in addressing burnout. So, you know, my, my clinical practice is almost exclusively in working with patients with higher body weight, but a lot of my patients with higher body weight also are healthcare providers. And I understand that many of you listening to this webinar today might be experiencing burnout. The numbers of burnout, particularly in the last few years, is astronomically high. People are exhausted and stretched thin. And so any way that we can chip away at that burnout and improve your quality of life, your job, your job satisfaction, and your patient care at the same time feels like a win-win to me, right? And then finally, for any of you that are still holdouts or that maybe are uncertain 
about the use of trauma-informed care and think that people living with higher body weight should still really, um, whatever, get more motivated or have more self-control or other things that are that tend to be biases around people living with higher body weight. Let me leave you with this. We know that a patient motiv uh, patient motivation is influenced by three important factors. And these three important factors are what we call key psychological needs for sustainable change. And this comes out of the self-determination literature. And those are autonomy, relatedness, and competence. And when a patient has autonomy, in other words, when a patient feels like I have choices, I can do this, I'm in charge of my own health, and a patient feels belonging, they feel relatedness, and they feel a sense of competence. I've got this. I know what to do. I know how to do what I need to do. So I have choices. I belong. And I've got this. When a patient experiences those three key psychological needs, it actually enhances patient motivation. And I want to be careful here because when I say patient motivation, I'm not saying motivation for weight loss or motivation to eat less and move more. But what I am saying is that patients who experience autonomy, relatedness, and competence have higher motivation for living a life that gives them pleasure and joy. And sometimes that includes self-care. It includes moving their bodies because it feels good and it helps reduce their stress. It involves getting engaged in community activities it, it, and so forth. So you want patients that have high levels of motivation. And so I can't help but notice that there's a pretty strong correlation here or overlap, if you will, with the three primary psychological needs, autonomy, relatedness, and competence, and SAMHSA's um, rules of thumb around uh, trauma-informed care that emphasize safety, patient autonomy, compassionate connection, trustworthiness, um, uh, a patient's sense that they can make their own choices, that they are on the team with you, and that you are culturally aware, a feeling of belonging. These two uh, pieces of the puzzle, I think, are highly overlapping and complementary to one another. So for any of you that are curious about the use of trauma-informed care or really want to focus on enhancing your patient motivation, know that if you take some of the tools and skills that we've talked about today and apply them, you're likely to improve both. So in a nutshell, if I had to sum up um, three sort of takeaways from today, it would be number one, weight bias and stigma experiences can cause trauma or traumatic stress for our patients. And it's important to note that many people who are living with high weight also are in other stigmatized categories. So for example, race, religion, um, a socioeconomic status, these other categories that are highly stigmatized often co-occur with living in a high body weight. So some of your patients will be traumatized on multiple levels and stigmatized on multiple levels. Number two, when treating obesity or working with patients with obesity, both the patient and the provider will benefit from applying a trauma-informed approach. And number three, trauma-informed care is really doable. It's practical and it is a powerful tool that when applied proactively can enhance patient motivation while simultaneously reducing provider burnout. To me, again, that's a win-win situation. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to the questions. Hey, thank you, Dr. Pashby, I'm, <clears throat> I'm left almost speechless, um, which is hard to do with me. Um, that was excellent. Um, really appreciate um, your insights. And um, we have a number of questions to address in just a couple minutes. Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen for a minute and go through 
few bits of information. But while I'm doing that, I want to encourage um, attendees to go ahead and and let's pack up that uh, Q and A box with lots of questions. There's some really um, excellent insights that some of you have already shared um, in that in our exchanges um, through the Q and A box. And I just hope that um, you feel comfortable continuing to ask questions, and we will answer as many as we can. So, uh, so now is the time to send in your questions to Dr. Pashby through the Q&A box. We'll get to the questions shortly. I just wanna remind everyone who has completed the program that you will receive a link to an evaluation in the next day or two. Once you complete and submit the evaluation, you'll receive your CE certificate. We really value your feedback and the ideas you provide. Although as everyone is encouraged to complete the evaluation, nurses must complete the evaluation in order to receive the certificate and dietitians at the minimum should enter in their CDR, <clears throat> CDR number to receive theirs. Okay, I wanted to alert you of a couple upcoming um, events here at McNair on November 15th from 1 to 2 p.m. Note that change in time. It's a little bit later than usual. Um, we have a program called Understanding the Connection Between Food Insecurity and Diabetes. Along with, um, and along with implications for practice, we will be talking about interventions. This um, presentation will be pr uh, presented by Ronley Roni Levy, who is a dietitian, registered dietitian involved in intervention planning policy and education. Um, and in December, we'll be welcoming Dr. Lori Kiefer to speak about psychological considerations in the dietary management of DGBI or disorders of the gut-brain interaction. This includes, but is not limited to irritable bowel syndrome. So to register for the November webinar, go ahead and go to our website. Um, and registration for the December webinar will, will begin shortly. You still have time to register for our two-part series, Nutrition and Cancer Care, provided by, uh, presented by Rosemary Riley, PhD, LD, and this will provide up to three contact hours or CPEUs uh, with session one on October 25th, and that will cover evidence-based nutritional care during cancer treatment, and session two on Monday, November 13th, which covers nutritional health uh, during survivorship. So part of each session will include a culinary demonstration outlining principles addressed during the presentation. And we encourage you to register for this program and you can do so by checking our uh, website for registration information. Okay, and now I'm going to stop my um, screen sharing and we will um, just go ahead and have a conversation. I wanted to thank you once again, um, Dr. Pashby for all of your um, insights that were so passionately presented and um, I think done so in a way that we can kind of glum onto um, and see ourselves doing. But to that end, uh, we have a huge number of questions. So let's just um, start with um, one that is a common question. How would you recommend bringing this up in a conversation with a patient? In other words, the first couple, you know, bits of conversation, um, how would you go about? What are some of the um, starting points or starting this conversation you use? So um, first of all, thank you so much to everyone who's attended and are writing in questions. And please forgive me, I actually have strep throat right now. So I'm feeling a little off my game. So if I if I sounded a little off, that's why. Um, but uh, I'm so glad to be here. So um, when you say bringing this up, I'm not sure if you mean trauma-informed care or weight. And so let me go about both of them. Um, trauma-informed care is not something you bring up. It's something about how you are. And um, so there's a style of being with someone that is trauma-informed. And really that starts with an awareness that every single patient you interact with is likely to have experienced some traumatic stress. Certainly all of us lived through COVID and that was a collective trauma. And so even if it's not weight related or not an adverse childhood experience, we can assume that everyone has been under very high levels of traumatic stress at some point in their lives. And so it's a style of interacting with someone that is gentle, that is compassionate, that is patient first, but not in a, not in a, um, uh, 
a, like a paternalizing way, of course, right? But just a simply a way of being with someone. And so I don't think that there's a way to bring it up and you don't need to assess a patient about their trauma to use trauma-informed care. In fact, that's why I put that hand washing up there because I really wanna make it clear that it's something that we do all the time, not something that we do only when a patient um, endorses having a history of trauma. If what you're talking about is how to talk about weight um, in a clinical setting, like how to use this to talk about weight, I think like bottom line, the most um, clear cut thing you can take away from it is ask consent, okay? So it feels like a given that you are a healthcare provider, a patient comes in or is, is in a setting where you are caring for this patient. It probably feels like a no brainer to you um, to know that person's weight, right? Whether you're adjusting medication doses, whether you're looking at blood pressure cuff sizing, whether you're talking about lifestyle factors, any of it. And so what I would argue is that the very first way you can implement a trauma-informed approach when talking about weight is to ask consent to have that conversation, right? And if you think about that, it just sounds like, would it be okay if we talked about your weight today? Or would it be okay if we got your weight today? Meaning, you know, measuring it on a scale and then respecting a person's answer, right? So those two things are just sort of the like foundation use of using and applying a trauma-informed care to discussing weight. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's really good that you brought up the, the clarification there um, that you're not bringing up uh, you know, you're not bringing up, can we <laughs> right. talk about this? It's rather um, living it. It's rather adopting that style of being, yeah. as you said, that that helps um, differentiate. So um, there are a number of questions um, about training, um, additional mm -hmm. training. Uh, how, do, how do we go about doing it? You had mentioned um, a couple um, things throughout your presentation, but can you... Um, help us understand it, you know, if we really want to work to adopt this kind of method, where, or method or style of being, how can we learn more? So SAMHSA, I would say, is sort of the go-to resource in terms of large-scale trainings. Um, but there's lots of local trauma centers, depending on where people are living and practicing, that certainly could help university centers and so forth. But I would start with SAMHSA, if what they're talking about is applying a trauma-informed approach. I think sometimes when I give talks like this, people are really intrigued in understanding more about internalized weight bias and really trying to understand how traumatic that can be for people. And so if that's part of the question, then I would encourage people to look up Dr. Rebecca Poole, P-U-H-L. Um, she is by far the most um, world-renowned study um, researcher in, um, in internalized weight bias. And she has copious numbers of resources. In addition, the Obesity Action Coalition, of which I'm on the board, we on our website, which is obesityaction.org, uh, we're a an international nonprofit organization aimed at reducing weight bias and stigma. And we have several handouts that can that are useful for healthcare providers to talk to patients in a in a different way. And even though they don't have training specifically on trauma-informed approach, I help put together a lot of those um, uh, handouts. And so I know for a fact that the way they guide you is through asking consent and talking to patients about weight from a trauma-informed approach. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this is a sensitive question. Do you have any advice to dietitians living in larger bodies? People can be cruel. It doesn't mean the dietitian doesn't know what they're talking about or be good at their job. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for that question. Um, I, I, I really, really understand that, um, that it's so challenging because as I sort of tried to lay out societal assumptions about what person living in a larger body is or isn't, right? Are they lazy? Do they not know anything? And then when you add in the dietitian field, it feels like, oh, you should look a certain way. Um, I'm very aware of that practicing in my own body, um, you know, as my weight changes over time too. So I guess what I would say is very first and foremost, apply a trauma-informed approach to how you talk to yourself um, because people can be mean and um, even, even sort of people that don't intend to be mean 
can make assumptions or um, or say things or not say things that can really land as traumatic for you. So the first thing I would do is treat yourself with care and compassion. And then one of the pieces of trauma-informed approach is transparency. And I use transparency a lot with my patients. So for example, if I'm working through um, a, a challenging clinical moment, I might say to them, so the reason I asked you that question is because X, right? So I try to give them insight into my process. And depending on where you are, whoever asked that awesome question, wherever you are with your own body awareness, body acceptance, it could be something that you transparently bring up, right? Like you are aware weight bias is alive and well in the world. And you might even consider saying to patients or to your clients, right? I understand that weight bias is alive and well, and maybe you don't assume this, but sometimes I've had people question me um, because of the body that I live in. And I want you to know that, you know, I'm aware of that, but I hope that we can move forward and whatever, like develop a great relationship or work really hard to get you, you know, feeling good about how your relationship with food is something like that. Yeah. What a breath air, breath, breath of fresh air when you bring in the transparency. You know, sometimes you think that that sets you up to being uh, vulnerable. Um, maybe it does, but in a healthy way. Um, I, think so. I love I that. I, I think that that's a great, uh, great strategy. Thank you. Um, one more question, maybe. How can we best apply this to pediatric or teenage patients? And I guess maybe perceiving that question might be, you know, can this approach be used across the lifespan? Um, for patients who are struggling with weight. great questions. So just last week, I was in Orlando, Florida at a conference looking at um, how do we engage adolescents, teenagers in particular, who have high weight, how do we engage them in advocacy and understanding? And so um, and if you look at the literature, basically across the board, uh, teens are open to discussing weight with their healthcare care providers when it is done in a compassionate way. So they are less open to having discussions with their parents. And so I basically counsel parents to not talk to their kids about weight, but when it's a healthcare provider, you use the same tools, right? You assume that there's a very good chance that that kid in front of you or teen in front of you has been bullied, has been shamed because of their weight, and you work to not re-traumatize that person, right? So you work on helping them focus on health, not weight, and the Stop Obesity Alliance is a great place that's through GW University that has a guide to helping parents navigate these discussions with teens that are really focused on helping them improve their weight. And I would add both physical health and, uh, sorry, improve their health, not weight, but their physical health and their mental health as well. Yeah, a great reminder that looking at things from the whole, the whole holistic <clears throat> view is super is super helpful. If I could just squeeze in one last question. Um, and thank you to our um, wonderful attendees. You, you have just provided excellent, many more questions than we could possibly answer, but they are so thought provoking and so um, helpful to all of us to be able to um, express these questions because we all we all have them. So thank you for the wonderful questions you provide. Um, real quick, how much um, with compassion fatigue? Um, you mentioned that that's important to address. It's something that um, affects healthcare providers and anyone trying to provide sensitive care. Um, how do you rebound from it in, you know, obviously- In 30, in 30 seconds. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, my my very small nutshell isn't you're not going to self care your way out of burnout. Um, I understand it's a system wide issue, and so hopefully what you do is you engage leadership to create a trauma informed environment in which you can work because it, it's not something that's on your shoulders to add in if you're already struggling with burnout. Um, so that's that's my 30 second answer. And I will just say um, I did give a very similar talk, but about actual examples of how to talk to patients. And that was through the um, academies of science, National Academies of Sciences. And that is actually posted live on their website. So any attendee who's interested in learning more about that approach could um, I can Lisa, I can email it to you and you can have share the link with other people who might want to watch that talk. Yeah, that would be really appreciated because I know lots of people are, are you know, enthused about this and want to learn yeah. more. So yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pashby. I can't tell you how um, uh, enlightening this was for me personally, and I've worked with this for a number of years, and and the um, attendees have um, expressed that as well through their wonderful questions. So thank you. I do hope you feel better and recover you. from your stress throat. And <laughs> wish you, wishing you the best of luck, and thank you for the, the great work you're doing in this. Thank area. you so much. Take care, everyone.